Okay, so our, our next speakers are uh, David Zhang and Kernveer Mohan. Um, they study AI at Stanford as undergraduates uh, and have authored several modeling packages in the Julia language uh, focused mainly on convex uh, programming. Um, and so their talk tonight uh, will focus on convex JL, which it, it seems to be uh, headed to be the, the flagship package for doing discipline complex, convex programming in Julia, and they'll talk a little bit about uh, what that is and about the package itself. We optimize the code, not the presentations. <laughs> this has got a good font and, and background. It, it does. It's yeah. quite it's relaxing. relaxing. It's very aesthetically pleasing. The red is the same as the red dot in Julia. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the exact same color. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. I feel like you're lying. <laughs> it's a little bit distorted on the projector. All right, hey everyone, I'm David, and this is Karnbeer, and today we're going to talk to you about Convex.jl, which is a uh, convex optimization modeling environment written in the language Julia. Uh, our main goal for this talk is to kind of show you like kind of how cool convex optimization is, and how Convex.jl allows convex optimization to kind of be accessible to everyone. So what exactly is Convex.jl? Uh, we like to primarily think ourselves as an interface between kind of math and solvers, right? So on one end, you're writing your, you're formulating your uh, convex optimization problems on paper with all sorts of mathematical expressions, and on the other end, you have these solvers that are usually written in low-level languages like C, and they expect the problems in like very, very standardized form, right? So if you wanted to directly call those solvers, you would have to kind of you know, stuff all these matrices and get it into the form that the solver actually. So we kind of reconcile these two sides of the picture so that you can write your uh, optimization problems with syntax that's much more like math. And we'll, do, we'll take care of all the stuffing and transforming it into the form that's ultimately taken by the solvers. And ComicsJL has a big focus on comics optimization, which is uh, a subclass of general optimization problems. So, why is convex optimization so cool? Uh, it's pretty fast. You can usually problems that are solvable in provably polynomial time. And you can get global maxima and minima as a result of how everything kind of works out in math. And uh, even if your even if your problem is not convex, often there are ways of still using convex optimization. You may be able to express your problem as a series of subroutines that are convex. Or you may be able to kind of relax certain constraints on your problem and end up with something that is common. For example, KB recently wrote something to kind of uh, figure out like what students should be put in what discussion sections based on uh, their preferences, time preferences. And of course, that's not convex because you have all sorts of integer constraints. You can't put half a student in one section and this other half is body in another one. But it turns out even if you get rid of the integer, constraints and kind of solve it as an LP problem and kind of round up to like the nearest student, uh, you end up with a very, very good solution that's almost often. So convex relaxations often work very well. Of course, there's tons of applications to convex optimization, machine learning, finance, signal processing, vision, robot control, of course, quantum science, Sadly, we don't have as much physics background as some of you in the audience. We have so, no computer science background. Someone has computer science background, but the rest of us have no idea. Yeah. So but we have an expert here on the, uh, quantum tomography. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. About this so she did tell us about something called quantum tomography, <laughs> which, is, uh, which I think, yeah, you can do with complex optimization. It's kind of figuring out. 
know, some sort of density thing. Can you tell us how you can use convex optimization for coping? Yeah. 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 So yeah. Please, I mean, that's, that's clearly yeah. some sort of one part. Crazy, crazy uses for cooking. There's a blog called Cooking for Nerds, which talks about there are all these recipes for the same dish. Yeah. And you want to know like they sometimes say, oh put hundred grams of sugar or two hundred grams of sugar. And you actually want like know or you know how much can I relax? So actually make one is full of the ingredients. Oh and, like you know like experiment with the recipes. It's right. on cookingfornodes.blogspot.com. Did they try any of these recipes and see if they? I just said code. Oh, okay. Theoretically they should. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they might be off of that. So hopefully uh, we've kind of convinced you that complex optimization is pretty cool at least. So we'll go through a little bit of the math in terms of like how convex op solvers and things like that work. So we'll start with just a few basic definitions. Uh, convex function, as a lot of you probably all know, is a function where the domain is a convex set. What that means is if two points are in the set, then the segment between them will also be in the set. And for theta in 0, 1, f of theta x plus 1 minus theta y is less than or equal to theta f of x plus 1 minus theta y. So this is a kind of long-winded definition, but what it really means is basically you, know, you kind of have like a bowl-shaped function where if you draw the graph for the function, chords between two points on the graph will always lie above the function. And a couple other definitions. A function is concave if and only if its negative is convex, and a function is affine if it's both convex and convex. Affine is basically like it's kind of linear, but maybe not passive. Cool. So usually you'll see convex optimization like on paper in this form. You're minimizing some sort of scalar objective function, and you're subjecting it to various inequality and equality constraints. Kind of the rules that you're working in are your objective and all the inequality constraints must be convex, and all your all your equality constraints must be affine functions. So this is usually what people like to see on paper. It's friendly and it makes sense, right? But it's not what the solvers want. A lot of the solvers, especially like the interior point ones, for convex op, expect something called conic form, which looks something like this. You minimize c transpose times x, and you subject it to a x plus S is equal to B, where S is in K, and K is what's called a convex cone. And convex cone is kind of just a generalized cone, where if you have a point in the cone, then the ray kind of emanating out from that point is also in the cone. Cool. So here are some classic convex cones that a lot of you might be familiar with. There's the positive orphan, where uh, points in Rn, where all of the coordinates are non-negative. You have a second order cone, which are points in R and plus 1, where the last coordinate serves as an upper bound for the norm of first n coordinates. And the semi-definite cone, which is the set of uh, uh, symmetric positive semi-definite matrices. So what convex JL essentially does is it takes uh, a problem that's very, very similar to the traditional form. You can express your problems in kind of traditional form, and we'll convert it to this uh, much uglier conic form and pass it off to the solvers. So to give you kind of a better idea of how all this works, we have a demo of a couple applications, one on tomography, sadly not quantum tomography, <laughs> and then one on uh, time series, and time series analysis. So we'll jump into that. We'll first do the tomography one. So to kind of set up the problem, uh, I'll kind of draw out what's happening. Wait, there are iJulia notebooks? Yeah, so oh. iJul iJulia is kind of like a I lightweight Python. wrapper around iPython. Okay. It's like iPython for a better language. <laughs> 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 I mean, it was only recently that I learned how to do the CSS. <laughs> so the idea behind it, all sorts of tomography, quantum tomography included, is you're trying to use various measurements to reconstruct some sort of density distribution of sorts. So our case, we have uh, kind of image tomography, which is very useful in things like x-rays. You're essentially blasting someone's body with light and trying to, based on those measurements, you're kind of reconstructing like how dense various parts of their bodies are. So this is a 2D tomography uh, on an image, so it's uh, lots of 
basically the idea we have is we have some sort of image that will dice up into Thank you. <laughs> and our measurements in this case are kind of lines that pass over the grid. Right? And these lines kind of measure over this pixel and passing over how much like darkness am I in. I mean, no, it's actually whiteness. How much whiteness am I passing over? Right? So what these actually also take into account is how much of the pixel I cross over. Right? So if I cross over a pixel like this, the amount I'm crossing over the pixel is going to be very small. Whereas if I cross a pixel like this, it'll be very large, and those will be taken into account. The thing that we have is the actual pixels. No, we, so I, we I have the lines. Yeah, we have kind of how the lines cross over the pixels. Okay. Right? So some of them will be large values, and some of them will be small. Are the, the pixels kind of the R model of the data, or are the, are the actual pixels actually, I don't know what the pixels are. Oh, oh, no, this is just kind of like the representation of what's going on. Okay, so you're going to try to this reconstruct our pixels. Yeah, we're okay. going to okay. reconstruct what each color, what, what each color of the pixels should be. Yeah, does that make sense? It's basically okay. intervals of one. So we yeah. essentially have line integrals over our image, right? right. And each the pixel kind of form our like density <coughs> distribution. And our goal is to kind of reconstruct the density of the image. Mm -hmm. And we have for each line, how much like total whiteness it crossed over right? as some sort of value. So that's the setup. Uh, so in our data, we have three data files, line indices, pixels indices, and line over pixels. And that line indices essentially uh, tells you uh, a list of uh, various lines. Pixel indices, the corresponding pixel numbers, and line over pixel tells you how much of that pixel the line crossed over, right? So for example, back in our picture here, if this was line one, and this was pixel two and pixel three, the value it crosses over pixel two will be very small, but the value over pixel three will be rather large. And the value over this pixel will be zero, because it does not cross over at all. So that's kind of the, so these three files kind of give you the geometry of what's happening. And then the last file is line integral values, which tells you for each line how much total whiteness is covered. So from that, we're going to essentially construct kind of a least squares problem to figure out how, uh, what color we should make each pixel. So here we'll start showcasing kind of the syntax of uh, what's happening in convex subject. So this whole chunk right here kind of just reconstructs the uh, geometry of the image. And what it's going to do is it's going to build a big matrix that kind of looks like this. Uh, and for each each row, will denote a line, so line one, line two, and the columns will denote the pixels. So one. So. And essentially, it's going to say for this line and this pixel how much it crossed them. So it's going to take the data and build it into this matrix. That's this, this first portion of the code up here. It's not too interesting. It's mostly just a bunch of vectors and matrix manipulations. So here's where the convex JL kicks in. Okay. We're going to uh, first set up our variable, which is going to be uh, however many pixels are in our image. Right? We kind of want to try to figure out what each pixel should be assigned, a value between 0 and 1. 0 being completely dark and 1 being completely white. Uh, next, we set up our objective function, which is the line integral values should be very close to the pixels times kind of that matrix we have over there. So it's essentially a least squares problem. We want them to be close, so we want to minimize kind of the norm of the difference. And then we have a couple constraints just to make sure we're getting valid pixels. We don't want anything to go under zero, and we don't want anything to go above. So here we have an array of two of our constraints. And lastly, we put the problem together. The problem is minimize that objective, uh, least squares objective, subject to just a couple constraints to make sure we're in the right balance. And then, uh, essentially, you can, given the problem you constructed, you can now solve it, picking the solver of your choice. Right? The one we chose was SCS, which is a 
I think the first order interior point solver that's open source and it runs pretty fast. So I think when we run it, it takes about 10 seconds to solve the problem. Yeah. And just kind of as a check to make sure that we're getting back things that make sense, if you look at the max pixel color and the minimum pixel color inside the pixel array that you get back, you get one, something very close to one, something very close to zero, which is here. And in general, in convex.jl, when you have a variable that you've set up, after you solve the problem, you can access its value with dot value. And lastly, we kind of plot what we get. We take our values in our pixel, we kind of refold it back into a squared image, and then based on the value from zero to one, we plot this kind of color scale thing. So you get the Linux pixel, which a lot of you may write. <laughs> I guess I'll go with the second example. Um, I'm not using the whiteboard, my handwriting's pretty bad. So, <laughs> I'm basically going to go over a time series example. Um, so basically, um, a time series is a sequence of data points associated with time. So like, suppose you have a vector x of time series, then xi would denote you know, what happened at like time i. In our case, we have temperature from Melbourne in Celsius, which is the right unit. Not pan night, but um, Thank you. so xi denotes the temperature on di, right? So initially, let's just look at the like temperature of, of Melbourne over 1500 days. You know, it, the high is about 28 degrees, the low is almost as low as zero degrees Celsius, so 32 Fahrenheit and something else. Um, and you know, one question you know you'd ask is what is the mean of the time series? And it comes out to be say 11.2 degrees. So if I went to some random person on the street and said, hey, predict the temperature for Melbourne for tomorrow, you know, one obvious guess would be, let me just say what the mean temperature is over the year. I can't be that far off there. And that would give you a root mean square error of about four, which is pretty bad. And then the question is, can we do better? And in this example, I will basically go over how we can model this using convex shell to, you know, say, get a lower RMS. So, you know, like, how can we load the RMS error? Um, so the few things we want. Firstly, let's just say that uh, we want um, something which has an yearly trend. So that the temperature today would be what the temperature was one year ago. Just to make life simple, or similar to what the temperature was one year ago. That can be enforced by a constraint of the form that SI, if S denotes the temperature on DI, is SI minus 365. Another thing we want is that the temperature each day should actually be very close to the temperatures we have. So I don't want to predict 50 degrees when the temperature was 30 degrees. So you want the error between the actual temperature and what we're predicting to be small. And finally, you want some sort of smoothing. And the reason you want smoothing is you don't, uh, the changes from the, uh, the temperature in day to day should actually be small, otherwise you're probably overfitting. So what we try to do is say that um, we want to minimize the difference between the temperature yesterday and today for every single thing. And this could be expressed in this form, uh, summation i equal to one to n si minus x square. This is saying I want the difference in temperature, with, um, our predicted temperature and the real temperature to be small. And this is basically enforcing smoothing. And then the question is, you know, I like maths. Um, my programming skills are questionable. Uh, how would I program this without wasting too many hours? Which a lot of us face. And that's what I love about ConnexGL is that it makes life easy, or so I believe. Uh, so <laughs> let's create a variable. You'd say yearly equal to variable n. It creates a, va a vector of size n comma 1. And if you want to add equality constraints, I'll just loop over them and say that, you know, I'm going to add yearly i equal to yearly i minus 365 to my constraints. Basically, uh, this is uh, enforcing that temperature today is what the temperature was exactly one year ago. And uh, I loop over um, all the given days. I start from the, th the 366 day because data starts from data at day one and yeah. Um, Here's a smoothing pattern. My smoothing objective is basically smoothing pattern times sum squares, the difference in temperature. And you notice that sum squares and um, equality, co the equality constraint, all of these have been overloaded by us, which is we want to make things look as much as close to math as possible and not have you know giant matrices which we have to deal with and calls because that's prone to bugs. And then we construct the problem which is minimize um, sum squares temp minus yearly plus smoothing objective 
uh, sum squares times minus yearly is basically um, this, and this was the smoothing objective. And we add the quality constraints. And then we solve the problem <laughs> using SES. It's just such a great declaration. You know, solve, and then yes, <laughs> solve. And it has an exclamation mark. And it has the exclamation yes. and make it super enthusiastic. Love. Oh, for those of you who are curious, the exclamation point is kind of a Julia convention that denotes that, that something you're passing in is actually going to get modified. So in this case, problem will get a couple fields like its opt val and status uh, uh, fixed after it's solved. And the variables will also get populated. With that. So is it assuming that all the parameters are being passed by reference? Yeah, Julia, everything is passed by reference. Well, uh, unless unless uh, it's declared as an immutable type, which uh, means it's passed, it's passed by value. But that's okay. yeah. No. So you just just so that I understand. I'm sorry. You saying the exclamation point means everything is passed by reference, or that's the default, oh, okay. regardless of it means everything's passed by reference. The exclamation is convention to say that you're mutating it. Yes, yeah, oh, I see. Just to yes. warn the user that something is going to be mutated. I see. I see. Yeah. So, so you don't have to do it, but it's, it's good. Because people should know if I'm passing in something, will it be modified or not? If the object is passed by reference, and this is just nice convention. I think uh, Ruby did this first. If anybody has used Ruby, uh, SCS solver. Um, like jump actually jump and contest mostly support the same solvers except we don't do nonlinear programs. So ECOS, SCS, Gurobi, I'll talk about them later. Uh, you can pass in options such as how many iterations, the verbosity level, etc. And let's now plot our smoothest fit. You know, like this looks pretty nice. Um, uh, Gatta is really pretty. But let's see what our RMS error actually is. And we calculate the RMS and actually first let's just calculate our residuals. This is what the residual looked like. So what the residual means is if the temperature was 10 degrees and I predicted 8 degrees, the residual is 2 degrees. And if I predicted 12 degrees, the residual is negative 2. And you know, this is all right. Our RMS is about 2.8. It's much better than 4.4 what we had earlier. So we are making progress. Um, did not write much code. You know, did not spend too much time on things. But then the next question is, can we make it better? And I guess our hypothesis, hypothesis would be that the residual temperature on a given day is some linear combination of the temperature of the uh, residuals of the past five days. And for those of you who are familiar with autoregressive models, this is kind of an autoregressive model. Um, essentially, what we are trying to do is fit the residuals as a function of other parts of the data itself. And mathematically, this is what it comes down to: that residual on day i is you know, a linear combination of the residual of the past five days. But here five is an arbitrary number. I guess, you know, you could have chosen six or seven, but we're choosing five here. And to do this, what we want to do is like minimize, you know, the sum of the squares objective, which looks like this. Because ultimately we're saying that um, we want the residual today to be a good, and the <coughs> linear combination that we have with the past five days should be a good indicator of the residual today. And so uh, we then solve this problem. Uh, again, it's fairly easy. All you do is like go through a for loop and do a minimize sum squares, and then you solve the problem. Wait, I'm, I'm very confused. I'm trying to model the residuals. Uh, we are trying to model. Yeah, we're trying to model, okay. model each residual as a linear combination. The oh, the is, is there some, some intuition as to why we would be doing Oh this? no, this is not actually that great of a model. <laughs> we just did this for the sake of the problem. You will not <laughs> get a job at the Weather Channel. <laughs> 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 I guess what I would have done is, is start squaring around that smoothing parameter. Yeah. Right. Because clearly it feels right. So. Uh, so. Uh, can, tell me, tell me why my intuition of varying the smoothing parameter as the first thing I would immediately do upon looking at that plot is the wrong <laughs> thing to do. I, I don't think it's the wrong thing to do. You okay. would definitely like do smoothing as uh, uh, tuning the smoothing parameter first. But one thing that would still happen is the way we have done it is that the temperature today would be exactly what the temperature was 365 days ago, right. and what the residual trying to do is actually like kind of change that so that um, we re uh, reduce the residuals compared to what the residuals were for the past four days. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so okay. that's the main intuition, but um, definitely you do smoothing, um, but that would just basically be like say a for loop where you try different smoothing parameters and see what the res residuals are, you know, do cross validation, I mean, etc. Sort of yeah. nice but yeah, think that, that's definitely <laughs> the right thing to do, but this is just for the sake of example. Okay. Uh, but uh, does this make sense? And then, you know, uh, we plot it, and the red line is our fit, and the green line for the residuals. 
we're not doing that poorly, I guess. And the next thing would be then, you know, we can add our autoregressive model to the original smoothing model. We have to have a better fit of the temperatures. And uh, this is more plotting code. And we do that and looks pretty nice. Um, the RMS goes down to 2.3. You know, it's still like, you know, not, not too bad, not great, but I guess like one of the things that we want to show through this example is that how convex JL can be used to like quickly write code and quickly solve problems, you know, if you have some hypotheses, test them, see how they're doing. Uh, I'll get back to those slides now. So the kind of functions we support, as we say that we want to be very expressive and we don't want you to, you know, reinvent the wheel or make large matrices for things. For example, if you want to vectorize something or reshape something, we have functions to reshape. If you want to transpose, uh, transpose, we have assigned functions that's taking the kth diagonal of a matrix or converting a vector into a diagonal matrix. Uh, there are element-wise element functions such as min, max, minimum, maximum, inverse, pause, square, square root, geometric mean, exponent, log. So, you know, you could have a problem of the form minimize, you know, sum e to the power x subject to log x is greater than or equal to 1 or something and it's a convex problem and that's exactly how you can. Your mathematical formulation and your convex formulation are exactly the same. Uh, we have vector matrix functions such as, uh, we're running out of space for them, but um, <laughs> they're all in the documentation. Um, uh, like norm, quadratic forms, quad over linear, norm squared, in pause, squared, absolute geometric mean, singular values such as nuclear norm or operator norm. Um, and I guess convex GL is kind of an unfortunate name at this point because we do support mixed integer programs and mixed integer second order cone programs. So for example, like the knapsack problem can easily be solved in convex. What you do instead of doing x equal to variable five, you do x equal to variable five comma int, which would say that this is an integer variable. And that would be the only difference. Uh, everything else would continue to be the same. Um, you can find all our operations in our documentation. Um, it talks about the vexity, slopes, etc. Uh, and then, you know, like, the next question is, you know, like, why convex shell? You know, as we said, like, we want separation of concerns. We don't want you to worry about how will this problem be solved, which cone is this in, is this convex or not. What we want you to do is write your math and, you know, like, let us take care of everything else. <laughs> um, one thing we haven't gone into here much is uh, discipline convex programming. Uh, how many people here have used CVX? Um, but basically, if you give us a formulation which is not convex, we will just throw an error at you saying this is not DCP compliant. So DCP is a subset of convex optimization problems where they've defined a few rules that are kind of based around the chain rule in how this how the software will figure out like whether what you wrote was legal or not. So there are ways where you can formulate problems that are legal in convex.jl and kind of equivalent problems when formulated slightly differently will instead be detected as DCP non-compliant. So convex.jl can't actually handle like all convex optimization problems, but it does handle kind of a subset of that known as DCP and that covers most of the things that you would see. And usually even if something is not DCP, uh, just on paper, there's a slight way to tweak it so that it is DCP. One particular thing is like uh, you can't you can't multiply things arbitrarily in convex.jl because in general multiplication is not convex. So if you wanted to construct a quadratic form, saying something like x transpose times a times x is not allowed, just because multiplication in general we don't allow it. But you can call the quad form function and pass in x comma a as a word. Yeah. Um, there's more about DCP on the uh, tutorial or. You can ask us more about it if you want. And then you like the question is what's next? Um, I guess as of now we feel the code is relatively stable and we're like figuring out new interesting stuff to do. So there's like other forms of convex optimization problems such as um, you know biconics problems like or things which can solve using ADMMs, which is alternate something method of multipliers. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are planning to support um, uh, complex matrices soon. So you can actually work with complex numbers. All right, uh, you excellent. Um, <laughs> you don't support. That's, that's totally how we, we do quantum mechanics. So we need this. <laughs> <laughs> we need this so hard. It's not even funny. Yeah. 
That's mm -hmm. what my professor told me. <laughs> why I stop, that if you don't have, if you don't talk about complex numbers, they're going to kill you. But we are working on it. Um, <laughs> I think there's just jump supported. I guess. I don't think so. Oh no! There, there are, there are uh, total order on on complex numbers. Um, right. There, there is a uh, package called dual.jl. Uh, which deals explicitly with that. And I think you generally define y your own ordering schemes in some sense um, using it. I, I, don't, I, haven't, I haven't used it um, that much, but I, I've looked into it. And um, I, I think there's a couple of other optimization packages uh, under the, the Julia Opt um, series of uh, packages that uh, reference dual. And so hopefully we'll have some uh, uh, complex um, functionality for these kinds of solvers. And it would be awesome to see to see it in this because you guys have uh, developed a really cool suite of uh, things that lets you work symbolically without having to uh, that lets you work symbolically without having to envelop your uh, your syntax and and macros or models the way the way jump is forced you to do. So that's I I really I think that's really cool. Thanks. Uh, I guess to finish up, um, there are a few links. These are on the slides. In case um, there's DCP of Stanford.edu, there's all use, there's this our sister project CVXPy, which is in Python. Um, and I guess these are the people who have been involved at some point or the other with Convexial. There are a ton of us, and we like to give credit where credit is due. And thanks. Um, if you have any questions, let us know. Uh, there are more examples in our documentation, such as say logistic regression or binary knapsack, etc. That again, you know, can be solved super quickly and uh, really pretty and nice. Um, and let us know if you have feature requests. Does anybody have any questions? More of a suggestion, but we had a problem that looked really similar to your temperature prediction problem. And what we ended up doing is we did a separate optimization model before that prediction, and we optimized the lambda value as an optimization <coughs> problem. So we looked at historical data, and we ran an optimization to perfectly tune the smoothing parameter. That turned out to be like a huge time gain for it to accuracy gain. So that would be some other fun way of formulating the problem, two-stage optimization. Yeah. What font did you use? On that? <laughs> <laughs> I think I used uh, Lato. Um, I, I can tell you later, um, okay. but yeah. It is a very nice fall. It was, it was very nice. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, I mean, this was really nice, and, you know, someone that doesn't want to learn too much about convex optimizations, I used to be able to use things like this yeah. conveniently. And I, I use CVX now, but, uh, you know, what, what can you tell me to convince me to, you know, rewrite all these things in Julia? Uh, I, what kind of advantages, I guess, would I gain from doing that right now? Mostly, I don't think you have to rewrite much. Um, okay. Converting MATLAB code to Julia code, at least at a very basic level, is converting parentheses into square brackets. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, um, for example, um, uh, WH364A, that's the Cloud on Context Optimization at Stanford, we support Python, MATLAB, and Julia. Okay. This was the first time we were supporting Julia. David and I wrote all the homework sets in Julia, and it was basically, we just looked at you know, existing code. We either made it much prettier because we could, or if you did not want to make it much prettier, we would just change it to two square packets. Mm -hmm. um, the CDX stuff has to change site. Yeah. Right. I think his yeah. question was why you yeah. do it. Um, yeah, what's the motivation so for so moving so it? You said it's easy, but now why, why yeah. do you do it? Compare, so compare to the CDX. Two things about you know, what's different between CDX and Convex Shell and what's different between MATLAB and Julia. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not an expert on the second question. Sure. Uh, for the first question, I would say that we support a large number of solvers. Uh, CVX supports some um, SDPT3, Sedumi as free solvers, mm -hmm. and then there's um, Mosec. Does it support Mosec? Yes, Mosec and Gurobi as the commercial solvers. Mm -hmm. uh, we support Ecos, SCS, every, um, Ecos, SCS, Cplex, Gurobi, Mosec, CLP, GLPK, which is like a lot more solvers. Uh, mm -hmm. We support mixed integer programs. I think con CVX's latest version also supports it. Ultimately, I think a lot of it also ends up being easier. Four loops are much faster. Mm -hmm. So uh, converting it into that tone form is quicker in the Julia? Yeah, I guess. I also think uh, CVX has some viewer license. You cannot use it if you want to use it for commercial purposes, whereas this is under the BSD. So mm -hmm. if you're using an open source solver, you're basically good to go. Um, are there other things you can think of? 
Mm, I think uh, I think a big part of it is just kind of the active community that we have in Julian. Mm -hmm. you know, where like the reason we have so many solvers is because of the math prog based guys and the Julia op team. We kind of just link up with math prog, math prog base, and they're the ones that are kind of in charge of all the solvers out there. I think, like at least as of now, you know, like Cirrus has been out there for about twelve years. Mm -hmm. We have been out there for less than a year, mm -hmm. um, which actually started as a like, last project. But we definitely think like we can take it to like, levels which Cirrus hasn't gone to. Cool. As of right now, CVX definitely has more functions than we do. Yeah. And, it has complex numbers. And, it's complex. <laughs> it's yeah. and it has multi-dimensional arrays, which is another thing we should explore. Are you but, at all? No, we are not. Uh, the Linux penguin's name is Tux. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Eric. <laughs> Does anybody else have any other questions? Yeah. So if I fit in some some non-convex uh, uh, problem, does that give any warning or error? Yeah, it'll yeah. it throw you warning. It'll throw you a warning. Uh -huh. If you want to solve it, it'll you can still call solve and solve will probably tell you. And you know, yeah. so, so I actually kind of have a question related to that. So yeah. you said the way you check the, the constraint you put on this, you utilize the chain rules. So, so I know there's a, a small effort in the Julia community to do a lot of uh, automatic forward differentiation um, stuff. Is that what you use to, to check? Um, or am I just totally off base? It's not something I know so, much so about. Each, so each of the functions kind of keeps track of a little bit of knowledge about its like first derivative, first derivative, first derivative of its arguments, right. and then it's how it's like second derivative behaves in, a, in like a very, very simplistic way, and it okay. kind of chains those together to give you kind of its idea of whether it's convex or not. So it's not always mm -hmm. right, but for the most part it is. Okay. So that's what DCP comes in. If it's DC, if you write the program in a DCP compliant way, it'll be guaranteed to be mm -hmm. correct if it is. And otherwise, they'll tell you no, but it may actually still be <laughs> Cool. Uh, you had a question? Yeah, you mentioned um, you still don't have support for complex numbers, right? Yes. <laughs> um, are you planning to add it? I would yes. be very interested in... Yes, yes. Um, if, I'm being lazy, but uh, I'm just trying to add it for a while. <laughs> okay. No, and, and like I said, there, there are uh, libraries that already exist in Julia that have been used heavily um, in other optimization libraries um, that do definitely deal explicitly with complex numbers. Um, and so it might be worth uh, checking out the scene uh, there and seeing and seeing what people have built on top of some of that based functionality that uh, already exists. Because most of the people in this room that do anything quantum very would appreciate it actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was told. No, no, no. I mean, it's not even fault. Yeah. Just say. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.